There we go. Um, well, thank you for the invitation. It's my first time in Prague. Um, doesn't look like I'm going to have a chance to see much of the city, but um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, just to, to, to be clear, uh, I never worked for Greg. Greg's office is way too good to have somebody like me working there, but I was his student, and it's always um, a pleasure and um, trying to figure it out how to be the opening act for Greg. Um, I always say there are very few guys in architecture that there is a before and after, and Greg is one of them. So whatever I have to say is completely light and completely irrelevant compared to what Greg will have to say later. Uh, just keep that in mind. So can we turn off the lights so people can take a nap um, <laughs> while, while I'm talking? It's possible to, take, to turn off the lights? Um, anyway, so let me start with a clip that maybe give you a sense what the way that we work and the way that I think about architecture to understand. <laughs> You know, I don't want there to be any hard feelings between us, Harvey. When you and uh, Rachel, Rachel! Rachel were being abducted, I was sitting in Gordon's cage. Now, I, I didn't rig those charges. Your man, your plan. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? You know what I am? I'm a dog chasing cars. I wouldn't know what to do with one if I caught it. You know, I just do things. The mob has planned. Anyway, I, there's, a, there's a couple of things I really like about the clip. The idea, one is um, this notion that he claims to don't have a plan, but of course he has a plan, which is more or less like an overall strategy. And then he make it up as he go by. But the other one is that he talks about that he's kind of like a dog chasing a car, not knowing what to do, what, what he does. Well, he will get it. So. This is something I always find interesting about the notion because even though I work through very dogmatic and highly choreographed techniques and methodology, at the same time I'm always looking for that kind of a level of unpredictability in the work and there is a kind of a level of a strategy that interests me to a point, but always I'm much more interested in kind of kind of the corruption of potential chaos that you can introduce to some of these kind of what I would call more hermetic processes. Um, I put here a series of uh, words and concepts that I think in one way or another has been driven the work of the last 10 years that we've done in the office. Um, and it's important for, I always have the feel that the obligation to explain uh, in an European, to an European audience that the, the landscape in way I, I operate, it has to do a big junk with the notion of uh, teaching and academic research that I do in SIAC and, and in Yangevante. So in a way, the work operates within, always between those two worlds, between the work of arch academic research and how that gets deployed into a kind of a practice. And I would not call it a research based practice, but certainly I would call it a practice that doesn't operate in the tradition of what I would be a commercial or a professional practice in the, in the, in the most traditional sense. Um, so there is a series of concepts that I think they have been absolutely crucial and relevant in terms of the evolution of the work. Um, there is a certain desire, as Rainer was mentioning in the introduction, most of the work that we produce is always done with ambition to be orchestrated both from a cinematic point of view and not really an architectonic point of view, an idea that comes much more from the construction of the image of a vehicle for the production of form and how those cinematics can some less cinematic effects can produce a logic of desire. Um, the other one is a simpler one, it's form for the forms. Um, a couple of things had to do with the notion of different alternative mechanisms for the production of beauty that I related to always to the notion of the grotesque and the horrific, not because I'm interested to produce uh, an architecture or a logic that is grotesque or horrific, but because I'm interested in those mechanisms as a different way to understand what are the contemporary possibilities of beauty. Um, the other four, it have to do much more with, I would call it, techniques or methodological approaches to it. Um, one is, what I would argue, is that within the last 20 years or so, or 25, it depends when you want to put the time frame, um, part of the computation fascination for me has been always to the production of image. 
an image as a new vehicle for the production of form. Even though, of course, these forms are produced still through geometry, at the end of the day, it's the image of it that interests me the most. Um, the other thing which I will say is crucial in the way that we've been working and the work has been evolving in the last 10 years is the idea of editing replacing the notion of composition. The idea that you can work in a non-linear mechanism, reassembly and restructure the process and the project, which is different than, I would say, the traditional notion of composition. And the last two, I will say, they, are have, they have to be much more with a kind of a <coughs> individual, individual personal point of view. One, it has to do with the notion of virtuosity. I have an obsession about virtuosity, about the virtuosity of the work, but also most of the work that attracts me from artists to musicians to architects to filmmakers always relate with the problems of virtuosity. And there are more often than not people who have that capacity. I'm not, I'm not arguing that what we do have that capacity, but the desire is in that one. And the last one uh, that I want to point out is one that have to do to be a little bit more specific about the notion of affect. Uh, now, the notion of affect, um, the one that the desire that architecture can produce a last and arousal, arousal quality. That's part of where the game is trying to operate. Now, within that, uh, there's a couple of things that also I think is important to, to claim um, before I show you some, some of the projects. One, it had to do with, in a, in a very, <coughs> in a very kind of a paradoxical way, I would argue that too, um, also a, a very classical architect in the sense of, classical in the sense to be in, in, in interested in the tradition and the relation of the discipline of knowledge. And in that way, the work of somebody like Francis Bacon for me is absolutely crucial because in my view, he was one of the most important paintings in the, in the 20th century, but at the same time, his techniques and his methodology in terms of painting per se were not as cutting edge or radical transformation like Picasso or Duchamp or other figures. And his work was much more rooted in kind of a traditional notion of portrait, old painting, and so on. But nevertheless, he captured a whole completely different series of aesthetic effects. And it's a whole different of principles and the capture of violence as a vehicle of beauty that they were absolutely, more, in my view, much more contemporary than some other artists who were much more radical in terms of the technique and the methodology. The, the other part is have to do with the notion of the image, but also the notion of geometry, and how you translate, um, and how you transform mechanisms of communication of conventions out of non-conventional elements. This is from uh, Enric Mirage's essay called How to Lay Out the Croissant, in which he tried to figure it out that. Um, in any case, I would say that the work that we have, we have produced in the last 10 years, in one way or another, it has been completely attached to the evolution of the technique and to the evolution of the technological apparatus. So in a way, I always, uh, I'm very comfortable with the idea that the work that we produce would be impossible to think in those terms without the computers or without the software. At the same time, I try to think more like in a partnership level, but in one way or another, the evolution of the work has been completely related to that problem. So at the very early on, in the early stages, at the very early stages of, of, of the work, I would say almost like in a much more amateurish way, it was much more to test the limits and what were the, tool, the tools allows us to produce. So there was all this desire of the singular surface trying to articulate every kind of possibility and try to work in, in those territory. But in this particular project, uh, when we did this competition for the YouTube Tower, it became like an interesting, it became like a, an interesting inflection point because it was the first time that um, the notion of grotesque started to be associated with the work at least in a conceptual way. And what was interesting to me about it that was that there was a kind of a emerging desire, emerging quality about the formal, uh, the formal aesthetic that was emanating out of this kind of work that it was not so easy to define, at least for my, my own terms. But what was interesting to me is that the origin <coughs> of the notion of grotesque is even though we tend to associate it then in a conventional way with the notion of ugly or disgusting or something like that, actually the origin of um, the word grotesque, it comes from when he's trying to define parameters of canons of aesthetics that can, it doesn't fit with whatever is established at a particular time. So, for example, in the work of somebody like Francisco Goya, when he was doing the Black Period, is one of the first times in, in which in the critical writing about art that the notion of grotesque is mentioned. So, grotesque is really an emerging quality, but it's not necessarily something disgusting, but it's something that it doesn't quite fit under the parameters that we were knowing. So, 
in one way I will say that grotesque is, is kind of something that emerged <coughs> and you not really can produce to an extent. But I will say the horrific, which is sort of related, I think you can co you can choreograph and you can produce it. Right? And in a way, for me, it's a different kind of sensation and logic to start to achieve beauty. So if you think of somebody like Alfred Hitchcock in the famous shower is in a cycle, you know, the twee, twee. I mean, you can imagine him with the editor, the music, the music composer, and so on, choreographing an emotional reaction to that particular time. So, in one level, there is a kind of a, a, a around that time in, in 2004, 2005, with PS1, uh, the PS1 pavilion for PS1 moment in New York. Uh, this notion of to start to flirt with the notion of the grotesque and the horrific in a much more specific way. So, even though there was a kind of a te technique dream and methodological dream and dogmatic or almost vocational approach to the problem. A much larger agenda in terms of, uh, of aesthetic principles start to start to rule the game. The other thing which was important for me was that uh, working with animation software, it was a, a way to start to, to bridge what I was my original desire, which was to be a filmmaker and not an architect. Um, so part of the possibility was start to, what if we start to use animation, but n uh, not only as a mechanism to represent or to simulate, or to produce multiple options, but to use animation as a way to understand and design the special, the, the special effects, the form and configuration, the structural principle, almost any other element of the architectural language we start to think about as a cinematic experience. Um, so this is what the animation that you've seen is exactly the same animation that we present to the, to the, to the jury at, <coughs> at PS1 in MoMA. And one of those things that happens, and we won, we won the competition, and, and, we, and, we be, and we build the thing. Now, what it was super important to me, and, and it became clear in that moment, was that I was really obsessed that the, the real pavilion would look as much as we can to the render, and not the other way around. I, I, I was, and I still am obsessed with a high level of artificiality and almost unnatural behavior about the architecture outcome of something. So. <coughs> When we start to show to some, when we start to send some of these, some, <coughs> some of these pictures to um, to some of friends, a couple of them send notes saying, "Wow, cool photo montage." And I feel I, I was kind of pleased because, oh, oh no. um, so because <coughs> it had this kind of um, artificial quality to it. So the other thing which was interesting is, uh, this is a very stupid process, um, PS1 MoMA. It's one of these ridiculous things uh, that the, uh, young architects get exploited. The young architect is a very relative term. Um, I'm already 44 and I'm still I'm considering an architect because I don't get to build much. So if you, I mean, you can be an architect until 65 if you don't get to build much. So the young thing in architecture is a very relative term. Um, but that being said, the, the thing is, the abuse of this <coughs> process is you have exactly eight weeks and say, tell you that you win until the pavilion need to open with a very kind of tight budget. But anyway, this was the first time that we started to use a scripting to figure it out how to build uh, the structure. There was almost 1,500 pieces of non-identical parts. I mean, each, each pitch was different. It was one of the things that you start to wonder, why the fuck I'm not a minimalist? Um, because it, 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 it was absolutely insane and stupid, but nevertheless we figured it out and there was a whole series of scripts and algorithms that a couple of guys uh, who currently work for great technology helped us to figure it out how to take this three-dimensional geometry and make it into two and bend it and rotate it and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing which was incredibly important for this, uh, and this is for the, those of you in the audience who are students, is uh, that I learned that to win a competition like this, or maybe a bigger one, you always need an engineer with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> it convinces the jury, makes people happy, makes people relax. I have the feeling that probably German accents will be the second in, in terms of choice. <laughs> but it seems like in America, at least the British one gets farther. The other thing which was really fascinating about was the process. So there was a kind of a low-tech thing about the structure with the fabric. But there was a far, a far more sophisticated way to produce these benches and so on that they were produced with styrofoam, injected styrofoam with rubber molds and so on. And then they were rushed up to be car painted before the composite was stable enough. So what it was produced in LA in the dry weather when it was taken to New York and the humidity 
and the summer in New York, it start to develop these kind of blisters and bubbles, and it really look incredibly grotesque. And Nikolai Urosov, which at the time was a New York Times critic, come um, to see it before the show opened, and, and he asked me if we did it on purpose, because we were into the grotesque and the horrific, and, uh, and I said, yes, of course we did it on purpose. <laughs> uh, but what it was interesting about that is that you understand that the logic of the work is always unstable, and it can keep evolving, and it can keep thinking about how you can play with adversity in your favor, and how you can use those conditions into your own benefit. Um, anyway, what was interesting about that, uh, I mean, one could argue that uh, uh, up to PS1, we were working with the notion of repetition and variation out of a singular entity, or a, sim a singular topologies that can produce infinite amount of variation and so on. But what I was interested about after that, it was, it was a possibility we can start to think in notion of a species and how the, these units can become more like a cellular logic that you can multiply and transform, but that doesn't necessarily need to be preferring always to the origin, but it can evolve into something more complex. So another, another show that we got invited to do uh, was a solo show at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And because we don't have the chance to do that many buildings, and we don't have the chance to have that many clients, every time, every time the museum invites us to do something, we always try to push to allow us to build or fabricate something. So in this case, the idea was to showcase uh, the logic uh, and, 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 the, and the ambitions of the studio, how we were working on it. So what I was interested in doing was not to do like a, a show of models and drawings and so on, but it was much more to one that it would take you to the trip of the logic, how the, the office would work. And so we have a whole series of cellular systems, cellular logics, or unit cellular is always a kind of cellular scientific bullshit, but it's really that unit and primitives that can have the capacity to transform and so on, and then you will go to a wall that was a whole series of animation, and they will show you how those things, through the animations and the different camera movement that we were doing, assembly and reorganize the types of energy, and then you will go into a third room in which you will see a display system, and they will have the models of the of final projects that the U2 Tower, a series of things that we did for Nokia at the time, uh, a, an installation in, 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 in Costa Rica, sorry, in Dominican Republic, and the piece was called Sangre, which means plus in Spanish. And in this case, we did the blisters and all the things on purpose. There was a kind of a, um, a kind of a logic that we were trying to do with the with the grotesque, with the raw, with the formation. I have to be honest; like many of these things, um, I'm not really a, a manifesto-driven kind of guy. I'm much more like a designer in the traditional sense, or a maker in the traditional sense. So we produce. And many of these conclusions are afterthought. They are not things that we or I, I predetermine. It. It's something that I discover as we go by. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the notion of autopsy as a way to to operate uh, as a mechanism. So you produce a project, then you analyze what happened, you, and that becomes the root and the beginning of the next project. So in a way, I always try to work in multiple projects at the time because it goes back and forth between those relationships and those processes. So that showed that there was an SF MoMA, then he went to the Art Institute in Chicago and took a different transformation and so on. So this is what I was talking about, the notion of autopsies. Um, I would argue that by now is when the work is start to move from I would say experimental to much more research base or a much more focus base with a clear design agenda, which is a formal one and an aesthetic one. So part of the experiment was to work in a, in a library competition or at that time when there was a proposal for a show at the Pompidou Center, but the idea was to keep a linger in this notion of a species, how we can produce a units that can grow and multiply, uh, but even though until then they were all based on the similar singular topology. This, this, this project was the one that they start to broke away from that. Uh, this was a competition organized by Frederick Migueru for Natalie Cerusi, uh, an art collector in, in Paris, that she wanted to have a guest house. Uh, she, she has a house that was done by Claude Toran with a series of sculpture of Andrew Block in the garden. And she wanted to have like a guest house pavilion to invite artists to work and live there for a couple of months. Um, so in this case, what we would produce was instead instead to have like a singular unit that can be deformed in multiple ways, we start to work with multiple basic basic elements. But we tried to assign like a kind of architectonic value. So some of them were more 
in ratio to the structure. Some of them were more to envelope. And unlike PS1, we learned a couple of lessons along the way. So there is way more repetition than it looks into it. So there are like four families of forms or four families of mechanisms of organization that they get rotated, transformed, and reconfigurated in such a way that it produces the effect that is a lot of, uh, there is way more differentiation than the what it is. And the other thing which was interesting about this project was the one that I, I personally rediscovered my own desire and pleasure in working through the plans and trying to figure it out what is the role of the plan in a world like this when it's much more like an MRI and in which it's not just a regular section but it's something else. But also I have to say educating Argentina plan we treasure plans way more than we treasure sections. So I never been a good section maker um, and most of the project always prove that. Um, but there is something about to understand that plans and sections and drawings are not the same thing that they used to be. They have a whole different logic. That doesn't mean that they're not important, but I was interested in how we can rethink about that. And part of the process to work with multiple ontologies um, or in con uh, one of the things that I think is interesting is I, one, one always like to think that they work produce radical changes and radical differences. And then when you see it together in lecture like this, you realize that there's a kind of a very coherent inch by inch movement, even though you, in your head you think you're doing much more radical transformation. So in a way, there is a kind of inherent narrative, a very cinematic way in the sense of frame by frame of editing in the way that the work operate, even though many of these projects are happening in parallel with different desires. At the end of the day, I always think that uh, when everything is settled, you're always kind of working on the same problem. Um, in 2006, we were invited by Peter Nover at the Max at the Max Center in, in Vienna to do a, a solo show uh, in one of the, in one of the underground galleries, and they have beautiful gallery space. So uh, I was like always I've been always fascinated with movies, like Rainer was mentioning in the introduction. But my fascination with movies is usually Hollywood movies, popcorn movies, actually. The worse the movie, the more useful I find them to use to find ideas and how to work on it. So we, I was at that time watching and rewatching a very bad movie called, actually it's a bad movie with a great effect called Pitch Black with Vin Diesel, which was a low budget sci-fi movie. But they have this amazing effect of, of a very well done monster that appears in the right place and this guy is blind and only can see it in a particular way. So part of the desire was can we produce a show that instead to use animation or cinematic to produce the form, that it produces a cinematic effect by itself and the thing behaves almost like an animation. So part of the idea was, okay, can we create a series of objects that they will float in this gallery and they kind of start to organize swirls of movement of people and so on. But a couple of things that we learned was the body of the pieces are all the, all the same, will be always the same and we decided that we can produce a small variation through the legs. It was cheaper and faster to do it that way, but it produced the effect that the, many of the pieces were much more different than they really was. Uh, but the other thing which was interesting to me was it was really the first time that we flirt um, specifically with the scale of art. Um, I've been accused many, many times to be a sculptural architect or somebody who worked like a sculptor and so on. We tend to be something that is offensive to architects. Um, um, I don't find it offensive, and, and in a way, I, I understand why people would think that there is a kind of a flirtation with that. But one thing that was interesting in doing this, even though the object have a kind of an art object or, or product design object <coughs> scale, not architecture, the way that I think or we think is a peculiar one. It's a very specific one. It's a very architectonic one. An artist will never think in the way that he thinks was conceived, neither a product designer, even though, so I will say this is an art object scale, but the whole conception is, uh, is an architectonic one, even though the, the effect may be artistic. But that, that became like a really, a very useful thing for me to start to elaborate on it. Because one, you come to the terms with it now that architecture is not per se art, it's not per se something else, but at the same time, um, I feel more among Corn for the with the idea of being a designer more than being an architect or product designer or artistic and so on. There's something about what what I find incredibly fascinating about computer mechanisms that they are like, they are not like they are scaleless, but potentially you can operate <coughs> with a sense of a scalelessness. So there's a specificity of a scale and size and always 
is different when you do an object for a museum than when you do in a, a concert hall competition like this one. But this is also a series of principles that you can move from one to the other one. So there's something about that where I call families of species that I find incredibly liberating and useful. At the same time, as you can see by now, um, I have zero capacity to edit work out. So every new variation of the species, it tends to have more stuff than the previous one. So it seems to be that the only possibility of evolution is keep adding stuff. And there is a movie coming out now in HBO about the life of Liberace, which was this super flamboyant piano player in Vegas. And the quote in the movie is, too much, uh, too much of something is always a good thing. And I thought that that, will, that was incredibly a dangerous thing to start to think about it, but maybe there's a quality about to think architecture in Liberace terms. Um, but in any case, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that with pride, that they, I have no capacity to edit this thing out. I'm just saying that's the way that the work goes. Um, so Natalie Cerusi, the, the, the pavilion house, she, did, she decided not to do it. It was too expensive, not only mine, all the, all the different proposals. So she asked me to do something much smaller, to do another pavilion on the same scale that the other block pieces. So we proposed to that, still that was too expensive. Um, so we went down, okay, can we do something else? So we use the same series of species, species forms and this one was much more structural. So, okay, can we do a bench? Uh, still, we didn't do the bench. But using that, some of, some of the things that we were learning doing that, we used it to play around for uh, a chair that was commissioned to us by the Art Institute for an exhibition. And I always wanted to play a little bit with the the the, the ink, ink chair. So what we wanted to do was to apply a series of viruses or agents of contaminations or transformation to it. So that that's what we produced. So it was completely based on the ink chair. I started to transform through the things that we were doing with Natalie Seruzzi. But what what this is taking me is what really I want to start to where I am really interested to talk to you today, which is much more where the nature of the work is right now in the office. And everything started as a transformation from that chair um, through this exhibition, the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. They did a big show on John London and they invite five architects to take one of the, the famous houses of Eames and add, uh, sorry, of uh, John London and add a uh, 30%. So we got the chemosphere, which is probably one of the most known. But the couple of things that was interesting to me was, uh, first of all, I realized that was the first time that we were working in a project we have a direct relation with an existing uh, structure. Um, so the notion of mid-fit, the notion of multiple ontology, is something that became really, really interesting to me. Now, I would argue that one of the most interesting are aspects of what I will see I see right now in the research in this body of work have to do with the notion of uh, there is a desperate desire to find agents of contaminations or agents of transformation and break away with the kind of dramatic quality that certain, uh, certain other techniques or forms produce. Like for example, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I don't subscribe to parametrics or I don't subscribe per se to robots. I don't subscribe to any particular kind of technique because I'm interested in the combination of multiple of them. And I'm interested in certain kind of I'm, uh, certain kind of raw quality or primal quality of contamination or mutation. Mutation is a, is a key word for me. Uh, that I, I find that that is, most, is one of the most interesting things. So I, I'm not interested in that the software only this mechanism to be the form finder. I'm much more interested in to put those things in conflict with a kind of a much more, I will not say intuition, but certainly kind of a emotional aspects of the world. So what it was interesting about working in this project was that we learned a couple of things about how we start to produce, to work with it in this kind of was an octagon with the pieces that we were to doing. And it also was one of the first projects that we start to use uh, platonic geometry. There are pieces of circles. Before that, we, we, every piece of geometry we were producing was fairly distorted. And the strategy was to add a 30%. Um, so basically, it became like an armature. It became like a prosthetic. It, it, it's not so important for it. But it was important for me was the idea to start to feel much more comfortable to walk, go back and forth with multiple ontologies and multiple languages and how that can start to introduce transformations of it. Uh, and parallel to that, we always try to work in three or four projects at the same time and different scales. Um, we start to work, uh, this is already five years process uh, with Alessi. 
um, still with not end at sight. I mean, doesn't we don't know yet if any of these things will ever make it to the market or to the production line, but we keep, we'll keep trying. Uh, so the first one that we did was this, uh, this cutlery uh, silverware collection. Um, we, we even built, they, they, they even built the, the 3D print, they started to figure it out, it, got, it went nowhere. But we started to tweak literally parts of those families and start to produce and change of scale. So Sefridges in London asked us to do an art piece to put, to put in one of their windows. And so we were using exactly the same geometries and the same ornaments that we were producing for Alessi and tried to bump, bump a scale into an art piece. And then in parallel to that, we, we, we did this competition for um, a media museum, a media art museum in San Sebastian in Spain. And again, using the same logics of the pieces. But the other thing was that a uh, certain notion of ornament, certain notion of a structure, certain notions of envelope, that they always been operating the kind of a tradition of the discipline, uh, it start to blur. So you can start to go back and forth on what they are. Um, I, I have to, I, I will be the first one to admit um, that materiality and all those things is not my strong, is not the strongest of my interest. Uh, also have to do, I think there is a certain aspect of pragmatism which is it's very difficult to think in some of those aspects where you're not confronted with the problem on. Um, believe it or not, every project that I'm showing you, absolutely every project that I'm showing to you, is a problem that was given to us, either to a museum <coughs> or to a client or to a competition. We do, I don't work in any abstract problem. I don't work, we don't invent projects. All the projects that we work, they, they, they have to respond to something. I'm, I'm interested in that friction. I think that is absolutely crucial for architecture to do that. But what, again, what was interesting about this competition that I find is one of the few projects I can look back and I still find interesting and don't feel repulsed by it, was the problem that we needed to keep 60% of the existing building. So part of that, again, the multiple ontologies, the multiple entities, uh, the multiple systems in, in, in friction is something that became much more interesting to me, that idea of, um, sameness or kind of a hybrid or homogeneity, which I would say the early part of the world was my trading, trading way more on that. So this one is start to begin, this became a much more uh, kind of specific interest. So in this, part, in this particular case, again, was driven out of the pragmatic, that was the problem of the competition, that was the problem that was given to us. But uh, like most of the competition that we do, we lose. So you try to figure out what you learn out of it and how that became a mechanism of a problem that you can use to work on it in the long run. So, um, another competition that we did around the time for, for, for the Warsaw History Museum in Poland, uh, in which, again, you can start to see how the species start to transform and evolve and, uh, and mutate slowly, incorporating more um, familiar entities. The other thing which I will say many of these projects have is what I call um, micro behavior or micro forms. Uh, so the more complex that we add at the beginning, they accumulate a series of effects at the end. So there is something about the, the idea of um, almost, even though I'm not a big fan of Jackson Pollock, there is something about the idea of the Pollock painting that I find fascinating. And, and every scale and every layer, every distance is always like a form of density, it's always similar. It doesn't change. So there's something about that fascinates me. Um, the the last two episodes I, I want to talk about this in, in, in relation to st how st I structure this talk, it has to do with the notion of rituals. Um, architecture in many ways is a ritual, uh, but also I'm interested in the conceptual and aesthetic problems of the ritual. Um, how the ritual tend to, most, more often than not, to combine high-end with low end, or something incredibly refined with something incredibly brutal. And it's the coexistence of those two things, of that duality that fascinates me. Like bullfighting, you will have these ultra ornament, sophisticated dresses, all handmade in these always super flamboyant colors, with the sword, which also is super sophisticated at the firing, and then it's about killing the bull, and it's all about the primitive ritual of that. And it's, it's, it's that interaction that fascinates me. But at the same time, it's always to a cinematic filter, like for example, uh, in David Cronenberg, um, 
the ringers with the, this movie about the two brothers which are gyno, gyn, gynecologists uh, they produce <laughs> sorry they produce this series of gynecological tools but they're made out of paper and and if you look at the movie those tools are absolutely irrelevant in the script they are absolutely relevant in defining the sensations it's the moment and they show you when they're operating on a woman that there's something wrong with these guys and there's something incredibly stored psychologically about it so those objects are there to signify something that goes beyond to the pure structure of the logic of the problem in the film um, but the notion of instruments and the notion of rituals became very handy when we keep developing uh, this is from 2010 and this is 2011 two different series of collections of proposals that we keep developing for Alessi and the idea to understand these objects as objects of rituals or, or rituals of manners. So the idea is not to treat them as pragmatic objects, but they're objects and they are much more embedded with the kind of ritualistic notion of from eating to drinking to any, any of these aspects. So what was much more saturated and kind of an over-ornamented logic and the newer version was much more um, much more uh, embedded with a kind of a sense of brutality or a kind of a much more primitive uh, or raw quality, almost like flesh transformation thing. So, but not flesh or in a plastic surgery kind of way, but in kind of a much more in a butchery kind of way. And I'll get back to that <coughs> in a second. That movie goes on for like 12 minutes, so I'm going to skip on and show you some of the pieces. Uh, bottle opener, uh, bottle cover, um, the silverware, and the other, these also have certain kind of uh, interesting byproduct. One was to eat with these things, you will have to grab it like this, and so it will produce kind of a social behavior modification. So <laughs> even though it have an excess, ex, uh, excess formalism, also it will change certain behaviors. I, I found that was kind of an interesting problem how a kind of oversaturated form can change certain notion of how you will operate things. Um, series of glasses, a tray, asteroids. Uh, this is from the 2011 version. This is, a, this is the only one that they have a certain chance to be fabricated. It's a candle holder. And this was a, a much simpler version. It's a, it's a single piece of metal sheet, uh, aluminum. And it have all these um, surface articulation dash ornament operating on the same level and at the same time um, it's designed in such a way that when the wax melt from the candles the, the wax became part of the object as well so these things hold the wax from going falling to, into the table and eventually they became this kind of a combination between metal and wax again this notion of ritual high end low end so it's not that only about all the time the perfect shiny metal, but it's all about the shiny metal in relation to something else. <coughs> um, this was when we were planning for the Biennale 2010, I think, uh, display system. Uh, another small installation for the Mackey apartment of the Max Center in Los Angeles. A very small, a very small installation in, in the garage. Uh, with a very light bu the budget, so we took all the money, we spent all the money in flowers, and we bought a couple of very standard plastic things. Uh, we put a series of animations inside, but what I did was I hired a series of Mexican ladies who does the funeral flower arrangements, so they figured out how to make all this geometry <coughs> out of flowers structural. So the notion of ritual to take it to another level, but the idea was also that this thing was supposed to be three months in the summer, so the flowers will start to go dry and start to get rotten and smell bad. And eventually the whole installation start to fall and collapse. So there was something about that that, again, it was completely almost we didn't do, use the computer for anything on this except for same very basic geometries. But there was something about that stream of the ritual of decay and transformation that was interesting. And also, um, I'm very bad. Um, I'm very bad and very afraid of using color. Um, I always think that with very few exceptions, architect sucks are using color. Um, you will see Greg later. I mean, Greg is completely unafraid of using color, and he's fantastic at it. I, I don't have, I don't have that sense. Um, so the flowers also became an interesting way to add a, a, a transformation over time to architecture. So the kind of a highly ornamental, super articulate form, plus rituals. Um, 
it was it was an interesting notion to start to think about that, like uh, Mexican funerals, Argentinian funerals, which the notion of beauty and sadness are all combined into one thing. Um, as probably said by now, I have fascination with very disturbing things and trying to figure it out how that uh, that disturbing of anger qualities you can produce beautiful things. So um, this was for the Thyssen Bornavisa. Um, Museum, which is based in Vienna, Francesca von Hasburg, the founder and uh, director, wanted to have a series of small, very small museum pavilions in different parts of the world. This was supposed to be in Patagonia. It's really only uh, 2,000 square feet. It's not really that big. It's, it's like a house size. Um, and the idea was to make it into different parts. So eventually, the thing doesn't get built completely. It still will stand as a piece on their own. So there was a kind of a hyper articulated a structure ornament that they also will work as a foil through which ivies and plants and flowers can grow over time so there is a kind of a sense of decay and transformation of colors over time <coughs> during the year and the different seasons especially in a string weather like in patagonia that you can have a super colorful winter and then go to a very dark sorry a super colorful summer and go to a very dark winter um, so part of part of the thing was to start to understand, okay, there is a kind of artistic quality, but the notion of, of rituals and also the notion of the sense of time and how we can introduce that as part of the architectural component. So if we were using animations and movies, um, okay. um, why not to start to incorporate that as a little thing? So. Yeah, this was an overall configuration. Uh, it was a museum with a small auditorium and a house for an artist to live in residence and so on. Um, these are some images of the models that they were in the Venice Finale. So the last thing I want to show you, uh, which is the most recent work, is what I would call, is the last episode, the episode six, Rituals plus Wrath plus Pampas. Um, as Rainer mentioned, I'm originally from Argentina. Um, and I don't know if this happens to other people, but at least to me, <laughs> after I became a father, I felt like I'm going back to certain of my own roots. Uh, for some weird reason, I start to look more and more into certain traditions and rituals of Argentina. Uh, and I bump into a series of TV shows about this guy. This guy is Francis Malman. Uh, he is hands down by far the most important radical innovative chef in Argentina, one of the most important in Latin America. Uh, he used to have a series of restaurants at some moment, as five, six years ago, something happened. He closed all of them and opened and started to go all over the south in Argentina and start to cook in the way that Gaucho was cooking in the, in the 19th century. I start to combine that with a lot of contemporary techniques of cooking. So it was, it's not really like a bully that is all about innovation in, 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 in cooking. It was a combination of incredibly primitive things articulated through incredibly sophisticated things. So the more you look into the things, the more you look into the rituals, the way that the, the, the gauchos, the gauchos part of uh, ornament that this, this goes into the boots is to, uh, is to spike on the horses so the horse can go faster when they go hunting using these things. So this incredibly primitive thing, a ritual thing, but with this excessive uh, ornament quality that it fascinates me, but also the idea that the uh, elements are completely detached from each other. So um, that became pretty much <coughs> the blueprint and the genesis for the current work that we've been doing. Uh, this, is a, this is a chair prototype and we've been working for a couple of years already, going back and forth, in which the structure and the skin are completely detached, formally and conceptually. They only have particular moments of empathy. So it's not really multiple ontology. They're radically different things, but trying to overcome the notion of collage. So there's enough moment of connections between the parts that allow them to coexist as a singular entity without becoming either a synthetic one, neither, um, neither a collage. And uh, out of that, um, finally, uh, after, I don't know, six years of working with Natalie Seruzzi, we come to a piece that she's, we are fabricating right now. It's going to be assembly and put in place probably by the end of this year in, outside Paris. So we produce this very large bench for her based on that, in that, well, the rose chair. 
And we are doing also a version for uh, a, a very close friend of mine in Argentina. We're doing a cow, a, cow, a cow skin version for it. And that's how it's going to be put in the, in the, in the Natalie Cerusi house. So um, I was mentioning a couple of times I was mentioning a couple of times the notion of butchery and the notion of bu uh, rituals and so on. Uh, I, I couldn't find videos of an Argentinian butcher. <coughs> this is an English, uh, this is a British butcher. There, uh, there are certain different techniques. But the couple of things that fascinates me about the problem of the flesh and so on. One is the idea of the solid, and the second one is the problem of uh, going back to the problem of drawing. So one is the problem of the cat the problem of the section, which is unlike Damien Hears and takes an animal cut in half, put it in a glass. So there's a very clear message of articulation of it. In this case, it's about following the topology and following the form quality and the rigidity of the bones and the meat to try to cut the different ones. So I find that a much more interesting problem to start to think the notion of assembly of multiple entities that they are not similar. That, that, that it can have a lot of difference and it still can produce a coherent whole. Um, this is a porcelain lamp that we're doing right now for a company in Limoges. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a small one, it's a small version, and there's a certain kind of literality, and, and I would not say figuration, but there's a certain kind of literality in the certain evidence of the ritual. But also, we did a larger version, which is more like a chandelier one, um, which I don't know if they're gonna do or not. The, the, small, the small lamp seems to be moving ahead. Uh, but in the chandelier version, the, the idea is to be much more open about the discrete quality of the different parts. Um, so again, there is a kind of a, I would say, a radical detachment, a departure from what the work was four or five years ago. Uh, the the, the work doesn't trade any longer this notion of hypercontinuity. Um, actually, it actually it's the opposite, uh, but in the way that I was showing about the notion of butchery, of the notion of the body and the mutilation of the body, the transformation of the body, so the idea that you can have different parts, but it still can produce coherent whole. So I'm not so sure if that's multiple ontology, I think it's much more, I would say, um, more like organ behaviors, uh, even though I really don't like that much the notion of metaphors about it, but, but I always think that if, if you're very literal about those things, the, the metaphor that can come through. Um, but when you when you when you walk, when you look at the work of art like this, which are the kind of a hyper reality, the notion of not producing not something that is presented as science fiction, but as a literal transformation and, and reconfiguration of the part of the parts. Um, so w I, I, I've been interested to take this literal notion as a problem. So this is uh, our official first art commission that we ever got. Um, I'm trying to, we're trying to see if we can figure it out. I, I, I want to do this piece made out of frozen meat and then we can plastify and it can change color. Hopefully it will not change the smell, uh, how it smell over time. But uh, we bump into some problems with the PETA. Um, I don't know if you have, what will be the European version is the, animal protection thing, but I tried to explain to them that they already their cows are dead. I mean, we're using pieces of meat. It's not that we're killing the cows. Uh, but in any case, so we, we are right now, um, through, with the collaboration of Sire, the robotic house in Sire, trying to figure it out how we can do these three-dimensional butcher cuts and try to figure it out. So I realized that the <laughs> literality of the meat is not so important. What is important is to understand the three-dimensionality cut and the reconfiguration of pieces that they could be completely different and, re and reorganized. Uh, we just did this last week. Uh, it's for an indie band in, in Miami. They're doing, it, they're shooting a video. They ask us if we can do, a, 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 if we can come with an idea for a mask um, for the devil. So basically, we took the piece, part of the idea with the, the meat, the sculpture, and we make it into a mask. That is not really important. It is show you because it's something that we just finished. Um, the second art commission that we got um, is from the Miami Ritz Carton to do a, a public sculpture in their front. Um, basically, we took the meat, the meat, pretty much the same sculpture and the meat sculpture, 
and we reconfigure it in a much more vertical marginal organization, but also it will be done either in porcelain or a very high-end plastic composite. So I was interested in the idea that we can produce a piece, uh, the same piece, but complete different material qualities. One kind of a raw primitive quality and the other one the most polished, almost expensive one and see how much the formal effect will be different based on that. Uh, I, I suspect that yes, it will be a lot of difference, but at the same time I'm not so sure how much. Um, right now we are in the process of trying to figure it out uh, the structure, the only problem with the structure here is winds. Um, we need to make sure that a tornado or a hurricane will not take it away. That's the only problem left to solve. Um, probably we need to cut some part of the budget. Uh, we were doing, we are working on a second version for the risk cartoons in the Bahamas. This is from an inside sculpture. <coughs> And out of that, um, we were interested to do like a porcelain coffee mug and coffee espresso. And this is not really in the sequence, but I wanted to show it anyway. We are we just finished the DD of this. It's a project for Boeing in Seattle. Um, we are working in, in, in partnership with Alex McDowell and the 5D organization that Alex founded. Um, it's really, it's, it's only an interior project and, uh, and the architecture part is, is, is only a small component. It's basically a couple of ceilings and a couple of walls. But the challenge was to integrate the architecture with a kind of a very complex uh, media, media articulation of information. Um, this is the ceiling. This is the ceiling part, and if you look at it, you can recognize there's a lot of the lazy part into it. Uh, even though it's much less raw, and uh, I would say it belongs much to kind of a, the more refined format geometry that we were do, trying to do before, but nevertheless, we're trying to produce some agents of distortion here and there, like this, these dimensional walls and some of the rustic agents in the walls. Um, anyway, I just want to flip fast, but um, w part of the thing also was to find the design the individual pieces, but, but the only reason I, I, I'm showing to you because it's, it's, it's the first project in a while that we got and we need to, that we, the, the plan is that they're going to build it, it looks like it's gonna, they're going to build it, so it was part to try to figure it out all these parts and it still is a working process and doesn't show the whole thing, but the other thing which was interesting to us was how the architecture works as a background for all the, these media distributions. So there's a whole, a, a huge amount of screens working in coordination at any given time. And so the architecture needs to appear and disappear, which for us was a challenge because we are so accustomed to put all the energy into the architecture and how you integrate those parts anyway. Uh, it's a different problem with a different nature, but I find it interesting. Um, so the last two projects I want to show you, um, one is a competition that we did last year for the National Library in Helsinki. It was also kind of an anomaly because um, like in all these Nordic countries, they do two phases. One, they do it open, they open to the public and the public vote about what are the favorites and then the jury can listen to it or not. In the popular vote, we were in the top five, um, but not with the jury. We didn't make it to the second phase, but uh, would make me wonder what, what the hell is going on. Either these people in the north are too screw up, or we are getting too civilized, and we're starting to produce architecture that people like. Um, and that maybe, maybe it's just a sign of times. In any case, what, what 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 to me was interesting about this is probably to take the string, the notion of the misfit and the rituals, was that there was a couple of really strong constraints. One, that you need to reconfigure the the rectangle of the site. So what we tried to produce was to work, which is also not very common in our work, to really work a lot with the program. So the idea was to introduce the library as, <coughs> as a park, the library as a public space. So the really the library happens in all these eggs, and each of the everything in the box inside is like a, is like a winter park. So it's an interior, it's a whole series of park activities that are happening in the interior. Um, that define that quality. So the idea was we take the library out, we make the, we put the library pa as part of the park, and what it seems to be the library really becomes another kind of park. 
So if you look at the plans, the only thing that we keep at the library was the, these spines that they will hold all the books and so on. But all the reading, all the reading rooms and so on will happen in, in the in the protuberance in the exterior of it. And the last project I want to show you is the second version that we did for the Thyssen Bornavisa Museum in Patagonia. Probably was um, the most radical in terms of the primitive thing. Um, so in this one, there was a kind of literality to really to treat the project as part of the Patagonian landscape and make it part of this kind of uh, animal ritualistic thing going on there. So the project became way smaller. The building per se is only 500 square meters now, which are the two main spheres. The rest is like a extended art, dash park, dash garden, series of interventions. So the idea is if they cannot do museum, at least they can give this little park to the, the, the town nearby. But so the notion was in this particular case was to start to, uh, again, try to compile all the different aspects and concepts that we were working over the years into one project. And in a way, this one has become in, um, between this and the Helsinki Library, uh, there uh, right now we just finished today, today another competition for a, muse a museum library in, tai in Taipei, in Taichung, in Taiwan, that combined these two logics of the rituals and the principles of it. So in the sense of, um, to really take the stream, the notion of stream differentiation, but at the same time try, try to produce a coherent, a, a coherent, um, a coherent series of relationship between the parts. So the other thing, which uh, I don't know if you notice through the images production, was at the beginning we were isolating our pieces. There was a, a kind of a strong desire to produce autonomous form, floating in black background, and so on and so forth. And I was moved forward. We start to do with this kind of hyper reality or dirty reality, so the idea that we can start to incorporate all these, the, the, the rituals and the landscape and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the context and so on, and make them into be agents and part of the problem, is much more into the world, in the desire of the world. So there is something about the notion of this contamination, this desire for raw, um, to, to, to try to put it in very simple terms, uh, one of the things Perfection through imperfect techniques, the idea that God, Virgin Mary, all that. And I think 500 years later, to computation and algorithms and all the things and these tools, robots, CNC, all the things that we have now, we have techniques that are kind of quasi mathematical perfect. So I think the logic is almost the opposite. Like through that perfection, there's a desire to create imperfection, how the imperfection gets built into it. At least that's my desire. So um, the last the last clip I want to show you to, to finish is this one, which I'll always like it. Really okay. Trust me. Everything's gonna be fine. <laughs> sums up what an architect is, is basically you tell your team, the client, whatever, trust me, everything is going to be fine. <laughs> but at the same time, you know that they always will meet you in a very strange time of your life. Uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Hanan. Um, are there any questions uh, from the audience? I mean, you you have now seen uh, and, and in showing what is going on at the moment in, in in architecture as a discipline. Somebody you would you would think or you would agree that uh, he's really working from the fringes. But when he's talking about architecture, he would still relate to architecture as a discipline that was uh, that was structured by modernism and with all the biology and the new tools in coming up with 
totally new notions of what composition might be or how things relate to each other. The question that that always strikes me when I look at Hanan's uh, work is uh, what would people look like that live in your architecture and what would be the consequence of these objects to the ambience? Meaning, if you change the architecture and things look like this and you can still, I mean, you, you can try to read them, what would that mean for people that inhabit this? Or what would it mean for a kind of effect that has on the surroundings? Would it also be necessary that all the world changes or can that be something that is, uh, let's say, a core that stays a core and as such then is more within the privileged uh, um, space of the art world? Well, I always say, half joke, half serious, that uh, I think my, my work and the work of other people that I like and sympathize is like salt. Like, it's very bad to eat food without salt, but it's much worse to eat just salt. So I, I don't think that the whole world needs to change into that. I think part of the thing is um, you need to accept the notion of the role of anomaly in a body world like that. But to tell you the truth, I don't... Um, I don't think I will do things that much to, in an honest way because I think at the end of the day uh, it's always difficult, hard, it, it's hard to predict um, the relations between what you do and how the consequences and how the people use it and so on. Uh, even though I, I know that many people do that and they do a good job. Um, on the plane flying to here uh, I was watching this, uh, it, was a, it was a TV show of one hour on BMW and the history of design and BMW and so on. And they were talking about one part of the thing was about the design and they were talking about the, the Chris Bangle seven series with the heat, the big back, which in terms of critique and so on was a disaster, but in terms of sales was super high and vice versa. And there is a moment that the guy who replaced Chris Bangle talks about that being a designer, in that case a car designer was like playing chess. Like basically, you try to anticipate the moves and so on, and try to anticipate how that was going to work in relation to culture, people, and so on. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's impossible to play 100%. So you try to, pl to play the how you can. And, I, and also, I, I, feel, I feel comfortable with the notion of architecture as provocation, architecture a certain level of friction. I'm not saying it's the only way or the, the way they should be but at least where I feel comfortable with it. Uh, uh, the question was also related to architecture as an educational system, because uh, the school that we have in the ambience of Vienna, which is, I mean, maybe not as bad as uh, what Peter Stetsch was describing as his, the situation of his studio in the ambience of Bratislava. But I mean, in, in Vienna, where we have a very strong technical university, um, people, when they, when they come to our school, they would ask students what they are going to do with it. And you should not forget also that after modernism, it would have, let's say, a pretty uniform construction of the world that was uh, democratic. That means there is no icons and no background. Everything would be of the same and would have different dimensions. Then in postmodernism, people came up with something that had, let's say, centerpieces and a background that was more uniform. The question at the at the moment or that people would ask our, our students in school, what is it that they are going to do with it? Or what is, what is let's say, the specific agenda? Because, I mean, you, and this I always found really interesting, is you do not have a causal relationship between what you produce as architecture in terms of urban planning or um, let's say social, sociological pattern where people in a pragmatic way would be able or seemingly would be able to say what the effects of architecture is. Your relationship is, is one that is much more emotional or goes into effect or is creating reaction in people that is more emotional. The question that I then would have and then I stop is uh, what strikes me also funny is uh, that it seemingly there is a kind of tragic worldview, <coughs> and I'm relating to the musings of uh, a friend we have in common, uh, Jeff Kipnis, who would always say that only death is 
the legitimation of art. Yeah. Romeo and Juliet die. Um, everybody who has or in serious art dies, nobody gets away happy. And uh, I mean, there is a whole book about this, Umberto Eco, who, who writes the book that Aristotle wrote also a book on comedy, but unfortunately it gets lost. And seemingly when, when you talk about rituals, the rituals, like the bullfight and what you have with the gauchos in, in, in Argentina, it's always related to death. And there is this notion that when animals die or some fish, then they put, in, put on the most colorful patterns they have in the skin. Is that something that uh, is, uh, I'd say, valid as an assessment? Uh, oh, that feels so Viennese. Um, <laughs> um, well, I don't know. To me, it's always there is a kind of a very paradoxical aspect because um, anybody who knows me, more or less, I'm a, I'm a fairly happy, optimist kind of guy. I don't have like a tragic view of life, or so on. But for a strange reason, I, I, I'm fascinated by all these kind of dark, um, borderline strange things. Um, but I think there are two different things. One is to understand the tragedy or certain pessimism that you can look around in the world and so on. Another thing is that doesn't mean that automatically you need to become a pessimist to do that. I mean, to me, it's part of how you navigate through that. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really so concerned about legacies and history role and all those things. I mean, um, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I want to build some of the things, but I don't live and die by that. So, I, I mean, this notion of the tragedy of the unfulfilled thing and so on, uh, it, it doesn't concern me that much. Because I think, going back to what you were talking about, the education and so on, I really believe if you, if you create a structure of education and stimulate imagination, and stimulate, stimulate a progressive um, push forward <coughs> attitude, I, I always think it's easier to pull back than push forward. So I always will take in a school like Dan Gavante or Sayark or UCLA or AA or any of these places, because I think it gives you much better tools, because I think it prepares you in a much more open, open mind understanding of architecture as a cultural practice at large, than architecture as a craft or architecture as a professional um, thing. And, and, and I know that many people will disagree with that, and that's okay, but um, I, I think at the end of the day, what you, I mean, if you have an education like that, what you work with that is a, is a way to different, to understand what architecture could be and what architecture can do and how architecture can transform, if you believe that that's possible. But, which, uh, but to me, at the end of the day, that have much more value than the other part. Because I think the other one is, um, is already well taken care. So part of the argument will be, I mean, I'm for the notion of imagination. And I'm using the word imagination versus the word creativity, which I'm, I'm kind of fed up with the notion of creativity. I find imagination a much more interesting one. And I think architecture education need to go back to that. or need to re But no, actually, there are schools that are doing that. But I think they need to reclaim a different way to understand that as, an, as a vehicle for the production of reality. I mean, if you look around, everything, everything that the reality has to offer actually is pretty much fucked up than anything that you can imagine. So I really don't think that um, that is outside the realm of reality, to, to think in these terms of exploring those terms. I think it's fairly common practice in any other field except ours. And if you look in any other field, they all have this kind of a much more radical progressive attitude toward things. Uh, and it's accepted as part of the evolution in any practical practical field. Architecture is the one that keep questioning all the time that. There's still discussions in many schools about, oh, should we use computers or not? Believe it or not, there's still that discussion is today. And how much technology, I mean, the, all the things, the architecture have that notion of melancholical, historical way that it doesn't never seem to go away. And there is something profoundly great about it, but also is incredibly destructive in other ones this notion of this way that they, they cannot let you move. So at the same time, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, that's the part I would say I relate more to art. Like I think you need to be less afraid to be in your own world and doing your own thing and eventually yeah, but it, will find an, it, it, it will find an audience or it may not. I mean, 
Uh, because this morning we saw some presentations where let's say the contemporary tools to reconceptualize architecture was more put to problem solving. More like uh, as a craft or as concept, as tools, like an engineer would use them. And in contrast to what we saw in the, in the lectures or in the presentations, in the morning yours seems to be of a totally different kind and almost frivolous. Now this is what I was referring to. I mean, not being, I, I didn't want to be critical. It was just, no, 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 no. I, I mean, there was just a total contrast between what happened in the morning where people were trying to use contemporary tools in order to solve problems in various scales. as architecture, as urban planning, and yours is pretty, let's say, is yeah. No, but Ati, and it has a totally different okay. relationship to reality. It is not something that would say there is a there is a an cause and effect relationship between what we do and what it produces. Like when you look at plants and what plants would yeah. produce and so on. Yours works. Maybe when you said I tried to to build the PS1 as the rendering was, as if the rendering was the reality that is the primary reality. So mm -hmm. there is a kind of well, the, I, I, by now I don't remember who said that this was a friend of mine in one weird conversation in Argentina, but he said something like that, or I, I made it into something like this. Uh, great architecture, I'm not saying that what I do is great, I'm just saying the aspiration of great architecture, a great architecture is um, genius, genius solutions to non-existing problems. And I'm pretty okay with that. <laughs> Well, I, I'm just wondering, Reiner, <coughs> and Hernan, I'm curious if you would like this legacy. If you look at architects that use serifs in the, their drawings, let's say, and architects that don't use serifs, Vienna is full of architects that use serifs. <laughs> so Huffman, Wagner, Ulbrich, all of that stuff. And I think the serifs are an indication of ornament of, you know, filigree, screens, all of that stuff. I think that it's no less problem solving or it, it's maybe less engineering driven and less concerned with structure and construction, but I think in terms of urbanism and site and program and all that stuff, it's as rigorous as Mies or Korb or somebody who doesn't use serifs. But I think it's a different aspiration about the, the architecture. And I mean, I see Hernan's work very much in the tradition of, of architects with serifs. You know, right, all kinds of people that use that kind of approach to figure. I think what you said, like, um, I think also what you're saying in relation to this and what Reina was mentioning is when we talk about problem solving, also. The question is what problems we want to solve. I mean, because uh, usually problem solving is always associated with certain notion of it. Like, if you look at, for example, the work of somebody like Sullivan in Chicago, I think what part of what the work did at the scale, at the scale, at the city's tissue level, to me, it was as powerful or important as many of the master planning that came after. That just just one <coughs> aside, when Otto Wagner talked about his Kirche am Steinhof, which is all ornament, which is all about classic volumetric composition, but everything is thin, like a thin surface. And Tafuri says, well, he has the volumes of something that is stable, but he uses a thin, um, a thin surface because he knows that the stability is already gone. But when he talks about it, he talks about it in a totally pragmatic argument. He says, mm -hmm. I make a space in the church that is a little bit inclined because I need to clean the church. I make a church where 95% of all the people can look at the altar. So this is what I was trying to come up with the difference. <coughs> Even if there is serifs in both architects, they would talk about it totally different. Whereas Wagner would always, for his, you know, for his uh, phallic uh, um, jewelry ornaments in the Pochbakasse, it has a reason because this is where the warm air comes up. And he would always find an argument that is pragmatic in order to defend his architecture. To defend it. Yes, to defend it, <coughs> or to sell it, or to be able to exist. 
But but say Ulbrich and Wright didn't do that. No. Yeah, but Ulbricht started doing it when he did the stations on the on the Donau Canal with all these masks, and that was still within Wagner protecting him. And then he did the secession, and the secession by itself should have been an icon. But when he goes to Mathildenhöhe in Darmstadt, he does something similar, but it was a show. But when he goes to Düsseldorf and he builds the department store, he loses the serifs to a certain extent. <coughs> yeah, you could say. Okay, any other comments? Otherwise, I go on with the program. And now I have to read.